This episode of Literary Treks is brought to you by Audible.com, offering more than 180,000 titles for smartphone, tablet, and desktop. To get a free audiobook of your choice and to help Trek FM at the same time, visit audibletrial.com slash trekfm. And also by Enterprise in Space, an international program of the nonprofit National Space Society. Find out how you can help science and education and become a virtual crew member aboard the NSS Enterprise Orbiter by visiting enterpriseinspace.org. And if you want to join the conversation and share your thoughts on this episode, join the Babel Conference, our listeners group on Facebook. Just type B-A-B-E-L into the Facebook search field. We look forward to seeing you there. Hey everyone, I'm Rod Roddenberry and you're listening to Trek FM. taking all these books? I thought I'd take some light reading, in case I got bored. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of Literary Treks. This is episode number 241. I'm one of your hosts, Bruce Gibson, and with me, as he is always, because we all say that on Trek FM, with me, as always, and that is Dan Gunther. How you doing, Dan? I'm doing pretty good. Um, Yeah. I'm on literary treks for once. This is so weird. I'm never, no, wait, always, always. I'm always you are on. You yep. always on That's literary right. treks. Well, you're my co-host on here as always. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Happy well, to and be here. <laughs> I, <laughs> and it's really great because I, I really enjoy doing this show with you. And the feature today is a novel called A Time to Love. And I mean, this just whole episode is just going to be about, you know, our bromance here on Literary Tracks. <laughs> totally. Absolutely. <laughs> to the point that we don't have any news. We don't have any new comic to read for this episode. So I'm going to use this as an opportunity to mention something that happened to STLV that should have happened a long time ago. So I had bought two comic books two Star Trek comic books from the ongoing series with uh, variant covers. It was issues number 59 and 60. They were the last two issues of that series. I bought them last year at Dragon Con, exactly a year ago from the time this episode releases. And I had Tony Shastin sign the covers because he was the artist of those two issues. And I got that for Dan. Well, I told Dan I had a little something for him. I wanted to mail it to him in his office there in Canada or his home or whatever. And I was trying to do it through my office and they said, Oh, we don't send to residential addresses in Canada. And then I was going to send to his business address. And then by the time I got around to go do that, then he left his company. Long story short, I just decided I'll hold on to him when I see him at STLV. So I finally gave you those issues that I had for 11 months in my possession. So I hope they made them home with you. They did, and uh, I'm still trying to figure out a place of honor for them and how to display them because that's so cool. I really, really appreciated that gift, and uh, man, I just so thoughtful and really great. Totally fitting in with the theme of the uh, bromance episode we've got going on here. That's right. A time to love. Because <laughs> we love comics. That's what I mean. It's not that I'm saying like, oh, I love you, Dan, or anything. I'm just saying like, you know, we love comics. We love the books, right? It's a time to love literature. Right. Exactly. We'll go with that. <laughs> well, you know what? <laughs> Here, you want a tissue? Here you go. You know, I, I worked with a woman that couldn't stand it that I would say tissue. She'd say, no, they're Kleenex. So I started to really just like drive her crazy. And like I would talk about, oh, this morning for breakfast, I had toaster pastries. And she'd say, <laughs> no, they're Pop-Tarts. I'm like, no, that's a brand. And so anyway, I, I used to have fun with that. I'm just saying. You really want to annoy somebody, tell somebody that you've secured something using a hook and loop fastener. That's Velcro, that? apparently. <laughs> Velcro the is the name is... brand, but it's a hook and loop fastener is the technical name. Really? And who invented that? Uh, that was that was uh, the Vulcan Tamir in the episode Carbon Creek of Enterprise, wasn't it? 
<laughs> that is correct. As ding, far ding, as ding, Earth ding. is concerned, anyway. <laughs> no, it was Pierre de Mestral, a French inventor. Ah, really? Oui, oui. Mm-hmm. I, I don't know French. Anyway. <laughs> oh, wait. Yes, I do. Uh, chicken cordon bleu. Whoa. Are you fluent? <laughs> That's about it right there. I know that's not French. <laughs> All right. Well, I think it's time to do a time to love in the feature. I think you're right. Let's, uh, man. Yeah. Just no news. This is weird. You know, I'm going to say though, because we've got no news this week, there's going to be like in between we re- us recording this and the episode coming out, there's going to be like a ton of new book news. I guarantee. Oh yeah. As soon as we finish recording this, you know, Simon Schuster is going to release like the next four novels that are coming out after the three in 2019. Exactly. And then we'll say, oh, now we get, because we have a gap because we, t- so I don't know if anybody's noticed, but we do three episodes and then we take a break and then we do three episodes and a break and it's just that routine. So this is a break period or that we're after this one. So yeah, this is our last of a, of a group of three. This is the last of a group of three. So and then we've got to wait two weeks if we get some really exciting news. But anyway, let's go to the feature and do that turn page thing. Here we go. So in today's feature, we're going to review the book, A Time to Love. Oh, wait, you already knew that because you've already listened to the first part of the show. And we've said that a million times. This book was written by Robert Greenberger. And uh, you may recognize the name. He was the editor of the Star Trek DC Comics line back in the late 80s, early 90s period of time. But he also wrote uh, several novels. And so this is the fifth book in the Time 2 series. So we've done the first four. We're doing one each month. So now we're on the fifth book. And then uh, he also, Bob, wrote the sixth book in the series. So this will be... Book number five that we're going to cover of A Time to Love. So, Dan, I think you and I are in the same boat, not the same love boat, but we're in the same boat that we both have not read this book before. Right. Yeah. I, uh, you know, when I pulled this one out of the box, you know, unpacking all my Star Trek books, this one did have bookmark of sorts. I think it was a coupon stuck in it about a fifth of the way through the book. So I don't know if I started it at one point and didn't get far or if I just jammed a bookmark in there, but I may as well not have because I didn't remember a thing about it if I had read any of it. So I I don't think I had read any of this before. It sounds like maybe you just, yeah, put a bookmark in and didn't read it because I would think... I can't imagine you starting a book and not finishing it, especially a Star Trek book. Mm, I've done a few over the years. <laughs> oh, no, but you didn't do that this time. You read the whole thing. I did. I read the entire book. <laughs> and how many days did it take you to read it? Do you remember? Oh, this one, probably about a week, I think, this one took. I, I took my time with it. Um, I wasn't... Hmm. This is this is going to sound like I'm really ragging on the book, but I, I wasn't hugely into the story, so I just kind of took my time with it. And uh, yeah, I didn't read it too quickly, which um, the book I'm currently reading, which is for a future episode of Literary Treks, I started yesterday and I'm at 82% finished now. So that's a bit different. So yeah. yeah, yeah, this one I didn't really get into. The one I'm reading right now for the next episode I'm so into it, but anyway. Okay, well, we're not jumping ahead. So So now this book, uh, Time to Love, it starts off with the Enterprise in the midst of months of patrol duties and missions that normally is assigned to lesser starships, but because of the events of the previous novels, especially those first two novels, um, they are being punished for this whole debacle with the ghost ship and so they're getting lesser known missions and so books three and four dealt with one of those lesser missions and we continue that now with book number five which by the way i read in i think three days Hmm. so anyway a number of crew members have requested transfers and the book starts off with Riker and troy talking about how to deal with all these requests because people are trying to transfer off a ship that's getting lesser missions and doesn't have the great reputation it used to have and so at this point they've had 17 transfers so far so at this point dan 
I, how'd you feel about this? That you know they're losing crew members on the Enterprise, the flagship of the Federation. People wanting to leave the ship. It doesn't seem right. Yeah, it's kind of you know to see the pride of Starfleet brought low and going through this slump basically because of the the hit that their reputation has taken. And I think they mentioned early on when they're going over crew evaluations and stuff that or personnel reports, whatever, that there's been 17 uh, requests for transfer so far. Uh, and th- this is something that Riker and Troy has to approve. And some of them, they're like, okay, yeah, we'll approve that right away. This person, we're going to try and talk to them and, and talk them out of it because, you know, we really hate to lose this crew member. And I really think they have the wrong idea and things are bound to turn around and all that sort of stuff. And then the flip side of that that I found also interesting was um, because they're not the most plum assignment now, they're not getting as many requests to join the crew, to have to take positions on the Enterprise. So they're actually getting assigned crew members now that they wouldn't have been assigned before. It's no longer the, you know, the assignment that everybody out of the Academy is looking for right away. Uh, instead, Starfleet is saying, oh, we're assigning this lieutenant to your transporter room because you're short there and this is the assignment that's available, which is not something that typically happens on the Enterprise. The Enterprise is the prestige assignment usually. And that's what's really fascinating about this story or the way it starts off because of the reason that the Enterprise is always highly regarded and you would think that all Starfleet officers are trying to get onto the ship. So the Time 2 series has really set it up where the Enterprise has to deal with itself as being a ship that no one is res- really respecting like they used to anymore and and not even respecting Captain Picard like they used to and the way they're being treated by Starfleet it's totally opposite from the way they've been treated before and this ship has been around under the command of Picard well of course this is his second enterprise that he's commanded but this crew and this captain have been together on these two enterprises for about at this point 13 14 years I think is when this story takes place uh, in his capacity as captain of the enterprise so to get to this point has to be really a weird, awkward situation for them and one that they want to find a way to get out of. But yeah, they have to deal with people wanting to leave the Enterprise. You know, I, this explains why we haven't seen Guinan in a while. She probably got a transfer off the ship. Yeah, it's it's hard to be a bartender on a ship that doesn't have the prestige. I mean, that, that has to be the whole reason Guinan joined the Enterprise D in the first place, right? I mean, everybody loved the Enterprise and she wanted to be front and center. I'm pretty sure... That's what motivates her character, right? Yeah. But no, yeah, this is, it's something that they've never dealt with before. And it's interesting that we're reading this um, now because it's kind of a theme that has come up a few times in the novels lately, like um, not to spoil anything if you haven't read it, but you know, there's, there's things that come up later in the A Time 2 series uh, that, carry on forward through novels that have come out more recently, like Section 31 Control, and the situation Picard finds himself in after that novel kind of feels similar to this, where there's kind of this slump and the reputation may be taking a hit. And justified or not, uh, there are certain factions in Starfleet and the public who are regarding Picard and the Enterprise with... uh, not not the love and adoration they used to have for them. No, I agree with you. It's it's it does remind me a little bit of what was set up later in control and and what the reputation of Picard and certain things. Yeah, it's just the same thing. But you know, I liked also there's a scene later in this book with Troy in Ten Forward trying to talk an officer not to transfer off the Enterprise. The officer comes in and informs her that he's getting you know, he wants her support in trying to transfer off the Enterprise. And she's like, why don't we have a seat and talk about this? And come to find out that she tells him that the mission, the, the starship he wants to transfer to is going to be in the sector of space where his home planet was. It Was it Bajoran or I can't remember what he was? Or I Trill th- think or it something? Was, oh, it was either Trill or Andor. I'm not sure. I yeah, feel, I, can't I feel remember. like it was Trill. Yeah, it was it was one of those, but uh, 
And then he's just like, oh, yeah, because he joined Starfleet to get away from home. And now she's telling him that the ship is going to be patrolling his home planet. He's like, well, let me think about this some more and get back to you. And it made me wonder if she was making that whole story up. (laughs) I kind of loved that, like, we have this seasoned professional psychologist who at first, you know, says, tell me about your reasons why you want to do this. Tell me about your feelings. Let's kind of try and work this out. And he's basically saying, no, I don't, I I want to transfer and I have to do it by this day or I won't be able to blah, blah, blah. And then she's like, okay, well, I'm going to play the dirty trick now. (laughs) Just guilt, not guilt you into staying, but like give you a very big reason why you should stay. And it's almost, um, I think she's telling the truth, but at the same time, it's, it's like almost holding his career hostage a little bit, (laughs) just a little bit. You know, it, it seemed a little bit of a dirty trick for Deanna, but I, I, I still thought it was funny. I thought that was good. It was funny. And sh- it wasn't the only time that she did a dirty trick. Actually, no, it was the only time she did a dirty trick. But there was a time that she didn't do a dirty trick. And that was with another officer, which we kind of get this short little storyline throughout this novel about her dealing with an officer named An Hoang who is in the engineering department on the Enterprise, who just recently joined the ship. And it was an interesting exchange to me that this crew member is not really befriending people, is keeping to herself. And I'm assuming we'll find out maybe more about this crew member in book six. But so far, it seems as if you know, there was something devastating. I can't remember the details, but something devastating happened to her, I think, during the Dominion War, and she lost some people that she loved or whatever. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like she just doesn't want to get close to people because of that. Yeah, it seemed kind of an odd choice to have this in the story. And I mean, like you said, this is just the first book of two in this larger series. So I'm assuming we're going to come back to this story and kind of find out more about her and get some resolution on it. But in the context of this book, and I don't want to say this as though it's a bad thing because I like when they give all the characters something to do, but it really did feel a bit like we have this in here so that Deanna has something to do in this story. I don't know. It just, it seemed weirdly out of place and I'm assuming I I don't know that it's going to tie into the main story in any significant way. And if it does, that's awesome. But if not, you know, it's, it's still kind of cool that we're getting, I guess, B plots basically. And it feels like kind of, you know, things did during the next generation. You've still got life on the ship just kind of happening while all the big stuff's happening as well. So I don't know. I have mixed feelings about this. I know what you're saying. I somewhat have mixed feelings about it too. I think we'll touch on this later because we're going to touch on one of those other B plots. There's a, other similar plots throughout the book that don't really connect to the main storyline of this book, but I'll I'll share my opinions on what I think of it when we get to the uh one of these stories a bit later. So, let's go on to talk about the main storyline. And we have William Riker's father in here, Kyle Riker, if you remember him from TNG. He has fled the sea. Wait, okay, wait. Which episode? Because I don't remember. The Icarus Factor from season two. This is why Dan's on the show. (laughs) (laughs) You know, it's, it's funny because we talked a little bit about doing the trivia in Vegas. And the one of the questions that briefly stumped me uh, was what was the name of the ship that Riker was offered command of uh, in the episode, the Icarus factor. And uh, so that's, that's kind of why this episode's sticking in my head. It's the USS Ares, by the way. And it wasn't the Drake. The Drake was offered to him before the next generation started. And the Melbourne was the best of both worlds. And I couldn't remember that one in the middle. And it's the USS Ares. And I will never forget it until the day I die now. Because it was the one Star Trek trivia question I didn't have an immediate answer to. You'll never forget now. <laughs> <sighs> well, that's good because it's going to come up again someday and you're going to say the Aries and then you go, and you know why I remember it? And you'll have a whole story for that. <laughs> exactly. I can bore whole new groups of people with it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can also bore Kyle Riker with it because in this book, Kyle Riker has fled the scene on Delta Sigma four, where this uh, story takes place on that planet, because they're in 
a crisis going on. There has been a murder. Okay, so before I get into that, so now this planet has been colonized by the Badur. I'm going to call him the Badur because I don't. It's B A D E R. I wouldn't say Badur. I Would thought you? Bader, but Bader. Just because it's Bader, it's Vader, but with a B. I don't know. But. Bader, I, Bader's probably right. I was just thinking about the French stuff earlier. I was like, hmm. uh, I kind of like so that. Ba- it's classy. Let's class this book up. <laughs> it's the Bader and the Dorset. The Dorset. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> it's actually the Dorset. <laughs> <laughs> so we have the Bader and the Dorset. They have been two races from two, to two different planets that have been fighting each other. And the two races, members of them have settled on this one planet. And it just so happens that these settlers are at peace with one another. They're not warring with each other. There's no fighting going on. The people from their planets are still fighting each other. But these two settlements are not fighting with each other. There's harmony. They're all getting along. This is the Star Trek way of doing things. Thank goodness. And they eventually even joined the Federation, which is great. So they have this long history with each other, but then they find there's a medical crisis involved here where they're finding that they're not living life as long. Their lifespan is shortening. And so there's a cure that has to be found to take care of this or they're going to die off. And so the Federation has come in to help them with this. So as a matter of fact, as this cure is found, then something else is going on where then all of a sudden on this peaceful planet, there is a murder. Dun, dun, dun. They never have murders on this planet, but there was a murder here. And now there's blame at the Federation about this because they're thinking that because the Federation has gotten involved in creating this cure, it is somehow connected to this murder. But anyway, the murderer runs away and Kyle Riker runs after the murderer and he departs himself. And now Kyle, and now Kyle Riker is missing. It's like Star Wars. The Force Awakens starts off. Luke Skywalker has vanished or is missing or not. I can't even remember exactly now what it says, but uh, Kyle Riker is missing. So of course this is going to uh, bring a bunch of feelings up for Will Riker because the Enterprise is assigned to go to this planet and try and figure out what's happened. And I kind of, <laughs> when, when the Admiral who assigns the Enterprise to this What a piece of work. Like, this guy's just a jerk. (laughs) Because he's basically, like, the Enterprise's reputation has been shot, and it's doing all these, you know, patrol assignments, and he assigns Picard and the Enterprise to this planet, and he's basically like, this planet is a mess. This situation is going to be horrible no matter what happens. So we'll send the Enterprise... You know, Picard's pretty good. You know, if he can figure this out, that might go some way to re- rehabilitating him. But right now, I don't really have much faith in him, but whatever. You know, it's he's so, you know, if he really feels the way he does about the Enterprise and its crew, this is totally irresponsible. But luckily, we know better. And the Enterprise is full of professionals and they will handle this well, I think. So, but that, that really bugged me. I was like, you jerk. <laughs> setting them up to fail. Oh. So anyway, Picard also spends time on the planet meeting with the council and the Federation ambassador Morrow, Colton Morrow, on, uh, serving on the planet down there. And Riker's then sent off to go find his father. And he's buddied up with a patrol officer named Seer. And Seer of Annan, he's a badder, bader, bader. <laughs> so it's like you know Riker and Seer the lethal weapon of Star Trek (laughs) buddy cop buddy movie (laughs) (laughs) I have to say I kind of liked their relationship I liked the back and forth between them Uh, there's so much happening on this planet that is being blamed on the Federation and it seems like everyone they talk to holds the Federation with disdain and, you know, kind of is looking down on them. And, you know, part of it is kind of understandable when you look at the history of this world and how utterly, totally peaceful they've been 
and you look at the history of the Federation, they're basically like, oh, you Federation people are just fighting all the time. You had a you had a war with the with the Cardassians and then a war with the Dominion and you fight the Borg all the time. Like you guys are just so violent. We're so peaceful. And, you know, someone from the Federation would be like, oh, I, I think we're pretty peaceful, but OK. And uh, so so to juxtapose that with the relationship between Riker and this seer of Anan or An Anan. So many, so many names that look like they should be simple, but I'm still not too sure how to pronounce them. It's really weird when you read a book and you just kind of make the word in your head or whatever, but then when you have to speak it, it becomes really awkward. Yeah. I, I don't, there's gotta be a word for that, but anyway, <laughs> um, yeah, this buddy, buddy relationship between them. I really enjoy, you know, he's kind of more pragmatic and, you know, is basically chaperoning Riker around and you know, trying to follow all these leads and find Riker's father. And it, they really start to get to know one another. You know, Riker meets his family and they, they have really earnest conversations, like just two regular people. And I kind of liked that as just a little uh, bit of respite from the big politic stuff going on with regards to how these people view the Federation. I'm with you there. Uh, exactly. Every time the scenes switch to Seer and Riker. I was always like, Oh good. We're getting back to them. I don't know what it was, but I really liked the relationship between these two. Mm -hmm. I think because Seer is such a likable character. And a lot of times we go to planets and you start to suspect that, Oh, maybe this person isn't really honest. Maybe they're hiding something or whatever. Like I almost expected there was going to be something about Seer that was underhanded. But Seer seems to be very genuine and honest and getting along with Riker. And I don't know, maybe we'll find something in book six that uh, totally ruins all that. And we find out Seer is up to no good. I don't know. Yeah. But <laughs> I, I'm not saying that's what's going to happen, but you never know. But I did like the scenes with his family and Riker, you know, spending the night at the home, getting up in the morning, having breakfast with the family. Oh, look, they made him coffee. There was just there was just something really nice and settling about Riker just being in that situation and being treated with such respect and with arms around him, you know, just walking him and making him feel at home. And I guess you don't really feel that all that often in many Star Trek stories when you beam down to a planet and you're just welcomed into somebody's home and you're just seeing what a normal, happy family is like. And I mean, there's there's more to say about that, which I want to save to another subject, but I really like that scene. Yeah, I, I agree. The the part where he's at um, Sears house and like you said, his, he gets made coffee and all of that. I really liked the character of his wife. She just seemed so nice. And I kept expecting someone in his family to be, you Federation types, I can't stand you, blah, blah, blah. But that just never happened. And it was such a, a relief, I guess. It was just... You know, a really nice environment. It was really cool. I think that speaks a lot about this novel, the overall theme and feeling of it. Even though there's some fighting that goes on later in the book, I almost feel like the whole book feels very comfortable. Like we're giving people a more natural feeling and there's not some underhanded play at hand all the time. There's no suspicion. It's just, I feel like everybody's just living their normal everyday lives and just trying to deal with an, a situation that comes at hand. I don't know. It mm -hmm. just, there's just something about it that just seemed very wholesome to me. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. I hadn't thought of that, but it kind of all feeds into even, even the, the counselor Troy subplot we were talking about. It's just, you know, things happening on a starship that regular every day going through your life. What's what's going on with this crew member? You know, how can we help? What's going on? You know, it's not, you know, even though there's still more to that story, I think that's unrevealed and, you know, some secret that's going to come out. It still feels very earnest, very family. I don't know. I like it. No, I'm yeah, I do, too. So. Let me ask you this. We move forward through this book here. Dan, I noticed that you have a bad case of gas. Can you explain that to us? Well, yes. Okay. So before we get into this part, should we say that we're getting to spoilers now? 
I would think your bad case of gas is a spoiler. <laughs> yes, we're going yeah. into spoilers. Okay. So the unfortunate part now is for our listeners who like to read the book before uh, listening to the entire episode, it's very possible that you've just turned off the podcast and you're just left now thinking that I have a bad case of gas. And so thank you for that, Bruce. That's great. But <laughs> what we do learn is over the course of this novel, uh, basically the violence is escalating. So it started with this one murder and then there's another murder and another. And then all of a sudden, very quickly, this violence starts kind of sweeping the entire planet and the racial tensions between the Bader and the Dorset. <laughs> I forgot their name for a second. The racial tensions between the Bader and the Dorset are escalating to riots and arson and, you know, just these horrible things happening. And we also learn early on that there's this gas that Dr. Crusher eventually kind of figures out is behind the medical crisis where the lives are shortening. Now, I figured out very quickly that where, where the story was going at this point, that this gas probably also made these two races very peaceful when they first settled the planet. And even though there was no direct evidence of that, I thought it was something that Dr. Crusher would immediately think of and then start testing for. But this doesn't seem to occur to anybody until the very end of the book. And it's so frustrating because I'm enjoying the story. I'm liking the story, but it takes them so long to even suspect that this might be the case. And I'm just page after page, like, come on guys, get to it. Like, you know, you, ah, oh, I, I, I don't, it, that really bugged me to the point where by the end of the book, I was, cause it, it's basically three or four pages before the end of the book where Crusher goes to Picard and says, aha, I figured it out. And I was so worried the book would end without them figuring it out. And we'd have to wait till book two for them to come to that realization. And I was just going to be so like, come on. But uh, yeah. And part of me was also hoping I was wrong. And maybe it wasn't the obvious answer, but it, it was. And nobody saw it. And it drove me nuts. See, I didn't have that problem. I don't. I didn't really give a whole lot of thought to what was causing it. I figured it was either something in the gas, which is called uh, liscum gas, mm -hmm. and that there was a relation to that or it was the serum or something was causing them. I didn't think that because of removing the gas from their bloodstreams caused them to fight one another and get agitated and, and feel hatred for each other. I mean, it totally makes sense, but I wasn't really thinking about it at the time. But once it was revealed, I was like, oh yeah, of course that makes sense. You know, when they came to the planet, this gas that's in their bloodstream made them peaceful with each other. And now that they we're removing the gas from their bloodstream, now they're being like they were when they were on separate planets. They hated each other. But I guess one reason I didn't really think about it too much is because I thought that when they came to the planet, that the gas didn't really get into their bloodstream immediately like over time it, you know so i guess in my mind i was thinking when they arrived to the planet they were peaceful with one another and over time the gas is starting to build in their bloodstreams over the five generations until we got to this point okay yeah see i uh th there's one aspect to the story that i thought would have been kind of interesting if they explored it a bit and that's the idea that the natural state of these two races is to hate each other, which is a horrible thing to think. And what it, what twigged me onto it was I think very early on, they basically say uh, the two races settled on the planet and everyone expected them to be at each other's throats. But for some reason they just got along really well and we've maintained that peace ever since. And it was kind of like that, it's unexplained, but for some reason, we just decided to put aside our, you know, that kind of repeating of for some reason, for some unknown reason. And then when Dr. Crusher's like, oh, there's this gas that's not present anywhere else. I'm like, oh, OK, so this gas has like sedated them or something. And I think the kind of interesting thing, if they'd have explored it, would be 
that the idea that being at peace would not be the natural state for these people would never occur to people from the Federation because humanity is so peaceful now and we don't have things like racial violence and that sort of thing that it wouldn't even occur to Picard or Crusher to think that the natural state of these people might be hatred towards one another. I was like, ooh, we might get a neat kind of um, discussion about that, and that's why it never even occurred to them. But you don't really get that. And I was kind of using that to fill in the blanks a little bit to make it, okay, maybe that's why Crusher and Picard and, and them never even thought that this could be a possibility. Yeah, you never know what's in people's thoughts because of the situation they're in. Think about it, Dan. You're just sitting there comfortably sitting back, reading this book, and you have time to think and ponder about stuff. They're in a crisis. They, they don't have time to really think about what I mean, they're, they're beaming people up to the enterprise that Crusher has to try to save lives and is dealing with all this blood and guts and stuff and trying to do all this stuff. And she has to use the EMH and all that. She doesn't have time to just like sit back and go, wait, you know what? Maybe it's the gas. <laughs> <laughs> well, she does have time to decide whether or not she's going to stay on the Enterprise or change careers and go back to Starfleet Medical. So if she's got time to that to do that, I think she has some time to do her job, too. <laughs> well, Sorry. let's talk about that. There are some seeds in this book leading to the future events of the, rela of the relationships between Picard and Crusher and with Riker and Troy. So... Beverly Crusher realizes that Jean-Luc will probably never marry and never settle down. And she has feelings for him. And yes, they've been close friends for a long time, but I think now she's starting to realize that, you know, she's really starts to have strong feelings for him and it's just probably never going to happen. And she's had an offer to come to Starfleet medical and run that again, like she did years ago. And she's contemplating about doing that. Plus the fact that, She's got her emotions kind of stirred up about Wesley and how he's been gone. And he came back briefly and he's gone again. And I think she's just at a point now she's considering maybe she just needs to move on and do something different on her own and, and kind of put Wesley out of her head and get busy doing Starfleet medical and be away from Picard. And so I like this exploration of that Crusher's going through as she's figuring things out for herself and her relationship with Jean-Luc because, and I know this novel was written before the post nemesis novels, but it really is starting to build towards what happens in later novels. We start to get like, you know, let's explore the relationship that really hasn't been explored much in 15 years. Yeah. It's, I, I do really like the exploration, like you say of Crusher and her, career options and just the idea that this group of people on the enterprise for this long doesn't make a lot of sense. And there are going to be changes in their lives, whether it's, you know, in their personal lives or in their professional lives that just makes sense. And so we see Riker and Troy growing closer uh, because of their experience in insurrection. And similarly, like you say, Crusher is kind of contemplating both her professional life and her personal life. And it's, I, I really like that. I like to see those movements. I think, you know, a lot of what these books are, are a reaction to all of the changes that were made uh, for Nemesis to kind of explain them all. And there are a lot of things I really don't like about Nemesis, but one, one of the things I really do like is it showed people moving on and, and taking on new challenges and doing different things with their lives rather than just all staying together on this ship forever and ever. Amen. Kind of thing without any kind of forward movement. Like I say, whether it's in their personal life or their professional life. So I really enjoy that exploration. It really makes them feel more like real people and less like just characters on a TV show that can never change. Yes. And, you know, they're not the only couple we've had on the Enterprise like this. There's also Will Riker and Deanna Troy. And it's always, are they together? Or are they not together? Is she going to go to Wharf and, you know, Minuet? He's going for it. Like, who knows what's going on with those two? <laughs> well, and he's grown the beard back. So 
Mm. And that's played up in here too, where, <laughs> you know, there's the kind of teasing. Now there's a little more, more romance going on here because, you know, we saw an insurrection that their romance is kind of heating up. And this novel takes place somewhere between insurrection and nemesis. And he's growing the beard back and she's teasing him about that. And maybe he should shave it again. You know, there's just all those little flirtation type of things happening. What I really love is going back to what we talked about earlier was the family life that Seer was living. And then Riker was welcomed into their home because it was giving Riker the opportunity to look at what Seer had and start to think about how nice it would be to be married and maybe have kids and have a family. It's like he's, and he started to think about, you know, is this something he needs to explore? Is this something maybe he wants to do with Deanna? This isn't played up really big, but there's the little seeds again being planted in there. That's maybe leaning towards like, well, maybe Riker's thinking about moving the relationship a little further. And like you said, in nemesis, the movie starts off with their wedding. So we know they eventually are going to get married. So it's nice to see just, a gradual progression in these books to where these characters are going to end up in nemesis, as opposed to just Riker woke up one day and decided, you know what? It's probably time I get married. I'm going to go propose to Deanna right now. It's just these little seeds of just thinking about, Hmm, I might like a family life like this. And maybe this is something I should start thinking about. Yeah. I really like that. It's connecting those dots and giving us that, that backstory that, exploration and, and explanation for what we see in nemesis because it, it does seem jarring if you just watch insurrection oh they're they're kind of flirting with each other and then nemesis oh it's their wedding day okay like <laughs> you know i i do like that we get these books that that's filling that in and i'm assuming we're what are we now we're i guess this book would be the halfway mark so we're we're halfway through this nine book set and the pieces are slowly coming into place. We're slowly getting th the picture that we see in Nemesis. So we're getting there. We are getting there for sure. And so I like that. So now we got the B plot that we were talking about. And we got like a few little B plots. But there's one in here that's probably the bigger of the B plots. And it's not that big. But it's involving Jordy and Data. And uh, they are in a scheme to trade parts there. For example, they need, you know, you know how this happens, Dan, when you need a RCS quad for your port and cell. Well, that's what they need at this moment and they don't have any. So, you know, how are we going to get that? Well, they start contacting a Ferengi and they want to do trades with the Ferengi. And, and so the Ferengi shows up and Jordy does negotiations and actually he does like he out Ferengi's a Ferengi in a lot of ways. <laughs> and uh, so what'd you think of this storyline? I don't know. This again seemed to me to be a little bit of, Oh, we need something for Jordy and data to do. Okay. Here's an interesting story. And it, it is interesting, but at the same time, so yeah, they've employed this Ferengi intermediary to kind of shuttle parts back and forth. And they're paying him with dilithium crystals, you know, to to trade various parts between starships because the inventories on the starships are getting lower because the Starfleet resupplies aren't as aren't coming as regularly, uh, presumably because of shortages from the war and that sort of thing. It seems strange. It, it seems like the crew members of an aircraft carrier getting, you know, sport fishermen to trade parts for things that are breaking down on their ship or something like it's, it's really weird if you try and think of like a real world analogy to it. And it just seems, this seems not okay. Like I'm, I'm interested in the story. I'm, I kind of like this Ferengi trader and I like the interplay that Jordy has with them. And, you know, even the, the other crew members on the Enterprise kind of going like, what's he doing? Well, I don't know. I guess he's got it figured out, though. Like, I, I like a lot of the stuff, but it really seems not okay to me. Like, it feels like this is very illegal. <laughs> I don't know. No, I think you're you're right. Uh, it does have that feeling of being illegal. 
And that's what I enjoy about it. I think what I like about this book is what I said earlier about it, the, just the feel of this book. I think that it shows to me that even though these stories aren't big, outstanding B plot stories, and maybe they're they're connected, maybe they're not connected to the main storyline. We'll find out in the next book, but it's okay if they're not, because to me, they were establishing what life is like at this time and what life is like on a starship. So in other words, there's a mission going on on this planet, but life continues on a starship that is irrelevant to what's going on on the planet. You've got hundreds of people on the starship and everybody's got their own thing that's going on. And what this showed me is that the Dominion War really had an effect on the Federation, on Starfleet, to the point that it's just not that easy to get parts anymore. That you know, all these ships are out there and they're all suffering because they're short on, on supplies, they're short on parts because of the after effect of the war and we haven't fully recovered and we're out here on our own and what are we going to do about it? Yeah, we can try to get to one another and trade trade different supplies and parts with each other, but we're on missions and it takes time to get to one another. So desperate times lead to desperate measures and you know, if you have to rely on the Ferengi and even try to outplay the Ferengi, it's like, you know, things have changed in the universe from the way it used to be when we were one happy Starfleet. I guess, you know, the more that I think about it, the more, I guess, if you think earlier in history, so maybe not an aircraft carrier on maneuvers in the 21st century, but like an explorer ship crossing the Atlantic or something like that, and then weathering a storm and having to, uh, you know, get wood from, you know, the natives (laughs) on some Island somewhere to rebuild the main mast and that kind of thing. Like, I I, I guess if you think about it more as out on the frontier than, you know, in the modern military, that makes a lot more sense. And I guess this sort of thing would be a little bit more, uh, there'd be a little bit more leeway for this sort of thing. And I agree with you. I mean, when I first started reading the storyline, I was like, okay, what is the point of this? Like, okay, <laughs> Jordy's just trying to get parts for a ship. Like, who who cares? Like, what does that have to do with anything? But as it developed, it's just what we're saying. It's it's the idea of the frontier and what they're dealing with. And even when Riker's on the planet, he's going to different parts of the planet. And all the places he went to, all the towns weren't exactly the same. I mean, to me, it felt like everywhere they went to was slightly different as if you were traveling this planet, you're going to see, you know, different climates, different ways of culture and different towns. And I felt that it things felt a little bigger and for felt more frontier to me in this book, not in some big, exciting way, but just in a natural, easy way of like, this is this is what it was probably like. You know, yeah. it's there's all these things you just have to deal with. I really liked that aspect of the planet, like the the kind of small town that they end up in. And there's a demonstration going on and they go to the local constabulary and the, the woman there is like, yeah, I know that things happening over on the other side of town. He's like, shouldn't you have, you know, people there? It's like, yeah, the other guy I have working with me is there like, you know, yeah. and it. I just, I just loved all these little communities and the different attitudes and that sort of thing. Like you say, it makes it feel very real because that's something Star Trek always does is the aliens are the aliens. And that's like, they're the, they're one monolithic culture. And this one, we've got a bunch of different cultures on this one planet, different communities with a different feel to them and feels very real. And you don't get that enough in Star Trek, I think. I totally agree. I, that's one of my nitpicks about Star Trek. I always feel like they go to a planet and, you know, let me speak to your leader and there's just one leader on the planet. And I think, well, if the opposite happened and it was a starship that came to Earth, who would be the leader that they talk to? You know, we don't have one leader of a planet, but it always seems in Star Trek there's one leader or there's 
two societies that don't get along on a planet that always happens, which we kind of have in this book eventually, (laughs) but you know, and then there's maybe two leaders on the planet, but there's not like all these different cultures. And, and that's one thing I'm really enjoying about discovery is the Klingons look different, but we're told that there's all these houses and we're going to see different looking Klingons. I love the aspect of thinking that there isn't just Klingons that all look alike. There's different races, there are different factions, there's different houses, there's just, you know, just, that's the one thing I liked about the Zindi. I mean, the Mm -hmm. Zindi were all like these different species, but they were all Zindi at the same time. And it just makes the universe seem bigger and broader and more diverse. Yeah, and more real too. Like it feels like more of a real place. You know, I'm able to suspend my disbelief that, you know, I'm not just reading a book, I'm actually reading about a real culture and a real world that Riker is having to explore and, and figure out and navigate. And I really appreciate that. I thought that was great. And I think that's what I liked about the B stories. Again, they weren't like overly interesting. They weren't like really exciting. I don't know really how they connected. You know, yes, they're dealing with crew members leaving the Enterprise. Yes, Troy's talking to an engineering officer about not having friends or not being social in the ship. And yes, you know, we've got the relationships being explored with each other between Troy and Riker and uh, Beverly and Jean-Luc and, and of course then with this whole thing with the parts. But it just Again, I don't know how to say it except, you know, it's just, it just was kind of (laughs) nice, you know? I I guess we'll talk a little bit about the end of the novel now, I guess, because we've, we've taken this entire book, basically Riker is chasing down his dad. And at the very end of the book, Riker finally catches up with him and that's kind of where it ends. That's the cliffhanger we get. It's kind of like I had the feeling of uh, the TNG episode unification where Picard and, and data go to Romulus to search for Spock. And at the very end of the episode, he said, we're looking for ambassador Spock. And you hear indeed. And you have found him captain Picard to be continued. So I'm, I'm curious what you thought of like the kind of cliffhanger ending of the story. It didn't feel like much of a cliffhanger to me at all. A lot Mm -hmm. of these books, I would even say the previous books, really feel like they're one book that's been cut in half. And, you know, maybe a little, if they were put together, they're a little longer than most Star Trek novels. But, I mean, I figured, you know, the more he's chasing his father, I felt like we're probably going to catch up to him in this book at some point. And so now we caught up to him. And now it's over. And it's like, well, I didn't expect the book to end, the story to end in this book. So it wasn't much of a cliffhanger to me. I mean, I've got it here in front of me where uh, Kyle Riker says, um, well, first Will says to him, are you behind what has happened to these people or the Federation? And he says, yes, but there's an explanation. And Riker, Will Riker says, I'm listening. End right there Mm -hmm. so not a big cliffhanger i'm not like (laughs) dying to know what's going to happen next but i'm definitely going to read the next book because we're doing on the show no i'm definitely going to read the next (laughs) book because i'm interested to know what happened but it wasn't like the best of both worlds type of cliffhanger yeah it's not worthy of the bum 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 bum. (laughs) like there's just oh okay and credits (laughs) right yeah no i i i agree and Without having read the next book, so maybe this is unfair, but it does feel in this book like they're kind of treading water for a lot of the book to just kind of pad it out and extend it and make this search a little longer. And then finding Riker's dad at the end, I have to think that like maybe this would have been better as one book and you take the second book and and you cut some stuff out and put it together. Now, again, like I said, I haven't read the next book, so maybe it's very justifiably two stories, but I don't know. This one didn't feel like it needed to be as long as it did. I don't know if maybe I'm being really unfair, but that I don't, that's kind of how I felt about it. I don't know. I I didn't quite feel the same. I thought the pacing was pretty good, but I can see it maybe feeling like a little slower, a little padded, but it's not 
not that much to me where I just felt like it was dragging on or anything like that. You're not, you're, did you think it was dragging? Is that what you're saying? Or a little bit just because, and I think part of it was because I had, I had figured out the gas thing and was wondering why no one was kind of figuring that out. Like you were having a hard time getting through the book cause you had gas. Ex- exactly. No, I, yeah. Um, <laughs> just the fact that no one, no one had gotten to that conclusion or thought that that might be a possibility. And I saw it very early on. It was just, it was frustrating to me that it just kept getting extended. And I was like, just look into this, just see if it's this. Cause I think it might be this. And then at the very end of the book, Beverly's like, Oh, it's this. I can't believe it. And I'm like, my God, <laughs> come on. Like it took you this long to get there. And yeah, I don't know. And then Riker, as much as I enjoyed the exploration of the planet and that sort of thing, it felt a lot of, uh, felt like a lot of, let's go here. Oh, Kyle's not here. There's people fighting. Let's go here. Oh, Kyle's not here. There's people fighting, you know, just kind of over and over again. I'm like, let's find him already. Like, where is, like, yeah. come on. <laughs> yeah. I, I, yeah. I can kind of see that too. Yeah. There were times I felt like, Oh yeah, here we go again. He's not here. So we'll just keep looking or, Oh yet There's another murderer and we still can't find Kyle. Right. Yeah. There was a little, yeah, I can see that for sure. Mm. But it didn't take the enjoyment away from me, but I, I do want to ask you something though. I still did enjoy the book. I will go on record as saying that. And, and I'm very curious to see how this all gets resolved and what Kyle's role in this is, because that's still very much a mystery. So it I'm is. really, I'm interested to find out what that is. And you like a good mystery, don't you? I do. Well, good. You can help solve a mystery for me. There is something, and this is going to chapter one. And so I want to end the show with this question for you because I have reread this several times and I'm still not clear about this, but Janeway, we have Admiral Janeway briefly in chapter one and she's talking to the other admirals and they're bringing up the whole Kyle Riker is missing thing and Will Riker is on the Enterprise, so he'll probably help search for his father. And Janeway makes the comment to this one admiral who says, do you know Riker? We don't identify which Riker. Do you know Riker? And she says, yes, that she once had a date with him at the Academy, but nothing came of it and they never stayed in touch. I was like, wait, which Riker did Janeway date? <laughs> I assume it's Will. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that's Will Riker. But I believe. I ex- Exactly. That's what I thought. I'm like, wait, is it Will? Or is it Kyle? I mean, you know, there's nothing to say she wasn't dating an older man. Yeah, but it was at the Academy, she said, right? Yeah. And I don't think Kyle was ever in Starfleet. Well, it doesn't have to be in Starfleet to be dating girls at the Academy. <laughs> well, that's a, I mean, that's a new image of, of Riker's dad just hanging around Starfleet Academy. <laughs> well, now that's we know why he's missing. That's the thing about Academy women. <laughs> I keep getting older and they stay the same age. Oh, we should not put that in the episode, but it is, it's, it's in there now. Can't change it. I'm telling you, this is where (laughs) Kyle Riker is right now. They can't find him. Go to Starfleet Academy. He's there. Oh no. (laughs) No. Anyway, I was just wondering about that because we see Riker in Voyager at one point with, you know, Q brings Riker. And I was like, wait, I don't remember there's any indication that they had dated before. I, oh, I'm, I'm looking on memory alpha. I got to look on memory beta because I think it's in a novel. I think they're actually, um, referencing a novel and I want to say, and this is just off the top of my head. It might be mosaic, the Catherine Janeway backstory. Oh, you may. Ooh, that intrigues me now. But I don't know if that's totally accurate. I'm just looking it up on memory beta now. I found something. Oh, you did? Okay. Uh, I think you're right. I think it is Mosaic. Uh, so it says here, upon entering her third year at the Academy, Cadet Janeway was interviewed by Admiral Owen Paris in regards to being her advisor in the writing of her junior honor thesis. Paris initially tried to turn her down since he, as a rule, normally only worked with seniors, but Janeway persisted. Eventually, Paris agreed, but warned her that he was a tough 
taskmaster, and he expected only the best, something Janeway constantly provided. With his assistance, she wrote a brilliant thesis, but had to turn down a date with cadet William T. Riker in the process. The following year, Janeway completed her doctoral degree in quantum cosmology. Oh, okay. And that and that's from Mosaic. Well, it says it? um then she like dated a lieutenant, then they were soon to be engaged well, they were engaged to be married or whatever, and then it references Mosaic and then a short story in the queue and the novel Lifeline. So it's gotta be from one of those three. But the fact that you said mosaic, I wonder if uh it is that. It could be. And then in the queue was the Star Trek Gateways uh, Voyager story. Um, yes, that's correct. And I read that. I did Ooh, too. I can't remember if that was in there or not. I don't know. But that's probably, yeah, you're right. That's probably. Now it says here that, now of course there's a memory beta. It's not coming from the source, but that uh, she had to turn down a date with Riker, where in this book, it was mentioned that they only had one date. Well, but it's always possible they had a date, and then he asked her out again, and she turned him down that time. See, it's a time to love. It is. I, I kind of really like how many times that theme has come up, because I remember reading the novel and kind of thinking, like, you know, I guess there's the the gas that causes the the two races to get along, but other than that, like, I don't really know what the title you know a time to love really refers to but i think we've uncovered a lot more <laughs> in this book than i realized at the time so that's maybe a more fitting title than i thought initially i'm glad you mentioned the title because there are times after we record a show i think oh you know one thing we didn't do is talk about the title like there's so many times where you know how does the title relate to the book in this case i think it really helps if you look at what the title of the next book is and is a time to hate so if you look at A Time to Love, A Time to Hate, as we've seen, these two species, these two races on the planet all get along in harmony. So it's a time that they're in love, I guess you could say. And, and now they're falling into the hate category because the gas is being removed from their bloodstream. So we're moving from love to hate. Yeah, I, I like that. And I like that it's a pairing. And that makes a lot of sense for sure. Well, that's why I'm on the show to make things make sense while you know all the trivia. <laughs> well, I'm glad I'm good for something. <laughs> <laughs> so overall, Dan, what did you think of book five in the A Time Two series? Well, like I said, I did enjoy the story and I am really curious to see where it goes next. The fact that, you know, I, there's a lot of elements to it that I think are really interesting. I like the where where the enterprise is headed. The fact that they they have this reputation that they have to build back up. You know, we have the mediocre voyages of the Starship Enterprise, which I'm glad we don't really see. We get the impression they've been doing patrols for months, but you know, we get to see the exciting bits in these books, so that's good. And uh, you know, just the the journey that these characters are on and the mystery of what Kyle Riker is doing and what's going on, I am interested in seeing what what comes of that. It, these books are a little frustrating to me because they're not complete stories. They do just feel like a story's been kind of chopped in half. So there's that little bit of frustration, not knowing what the story is going to end up looking like makes it a little hard to kind of figure it out. And the fact that there's kind of that meandering that was a little frustrating because I, you know, sussed out what the main impetus for the plot would be. So um, that said, like, like I said, I did enjoy it. So I think I'd have to give it, um, I'd say three cups of coffee on an alien world out of five. Okay. Well, enjoy that coffee because you're going to be up all night with three cups if they're caffeinated. That's true. <laughs> So, yeah, I'm with you on that. I think with the whole A Time 2 series, what I'm gathering from this is that these authors were hired to write 
one story divided into two novels. And I think in all cases that there is some padding and some stretching at times. I think this whole series probably would have played better if they could just take their stories and write them as a novel, which is somewhere, you know, close to, you know, 350, 400 pages as to opposed to trying to stretch it out to 600. I think if you had a single author that was working on a series and plotted it out over the course of three or four books and really made some big epic thing with multiple multiple storylines, then you can have multiple books. But I do feel like it's a single story divided into two books and it doesn't necessarily have all the complex storylines intertwined in there to really make it full and take it through to two novels. But I did enjoy this quite a bit. And uh, for all the reasons I said before that, I think it really feels like, yeah, it's out there on the frontier and the scope of the planet and the characters and the seeds that are planted about the relationships and just how things are on a starship and uh, the crises that they have to deal with. So I'm going to give this novel four B plots out of five. Oh, wow. I think there were about four B plots in it. So that's good. <laughs> and that's why I mentioned that. So as far as bromance episodes go, I think that one turned out quite well. We found a lot of things for which it was a time to love. It was. I just wish we would have done this on Valentine's Day. Oh, that would have been perfect. <laughs> Well, you know what? It's been fun talking about love today, but this isn't the only thing we've been discussing here on the network. So here's a quick look at some of the other lovely things you may have missed elsewhere on Trek.fm. Previously on Trek.fm, the 602 Club. Well, and I think that uh, there's even, you know, a, a kernel of that conversation uh, reflected in when he is on uh, the, the airship with his dad and it's very interesting because Indy gives you know they give the the two versions of the story where you know you were distant you didn't hang out with me you didn't do these things I didn't have a normal dad like every other kid and then you hear uh, you know Henry Jones Sr. say I never told you to wash behind your ears I never checked up on your homework I gave you all of the freedom and independence that you wanted and if you were to ask any kid They'd say that's what they wanted. And then you find out, to speak to the point about fact and truth, that that's not necessarily what you want. You want involvement. You want connection. You want to be together. You want to be part of your family unit. And you want it to be cohesive. I mean, you know, at a, at, at a baseline, that's what everybody wants. Warp 5. So for the listeners, if you haven't watched this episode, she murders. She's unsure of if she murders, but she kills the seventh person she was supposed to round up. Whoa, the seventh! Oh, what a shock! (gasps) Be still, my heart. So, so, he mockingly said, To the journey! I love that Barkley says he's lost himself in Voyager because I have been there, man. Haven't we all, Reg? Haven't we all? It hits a little close to home. It does. I'm a little bit like Barkley in some ways. I, you know, I have just a little bit of paranoia to me. Awkward? No, a little paranoid. No, I don't think I'm awkward. No. Okay, maybe, <laughs> maybe a little bit. <laughs> well, you said you're like Barkley. Awkward. Give me a glass of wine and I'm fine. Okay. <laughs> Sent the hall. Excuse me. Sent the hall. Melodic tricks. Okay, so that's one of the things they do. Um, the music is much more enhanced and the music is louder uh, when you're sitting in the audience. The, the dialogue is, is lowered so that you can hear the music. The idea is to get you to appreciate what the score is all about. Okay. And the idea is to focus your mind on the music rather than on the movie. But actually, your brain does tricks, and it's very difficult to disassociate yourself. So you're staring at the screen, and then you kind of have to pinch yourself and remind yourself that there's a full live orchestra on the stage. And that's what else is happening on Trek.fm. Check out all these shows and join the conversation about your favorite corner of the Star Trek universe and beyond. And you'll find us wherever you get your podcasts. If you're an Apple user... Be sure and hit that subscribe button in Apple Podcasts on iPhone, iPad, or Apple TV, or the desktop iTunes app to get the latest episodes as soon as they're published. And if you have the time, we'd love it if you left us a star rating and a written review. 
But if you're not an Apple user, we've got you covered as well. You can find all of the Trek FM shows on Google Play Music, Stitcher, TuneIn, Spreaker, SoundCloud, Windows Phone, in most third-party apps. And you can also, of course, stream and download the MP3 file from our website or grab the RSS link as well. So help us keep all these shows coming to you. And you can do that by being a patron on the network on the network on Patreon. So just go to patreon.com slash Trek FM. That's P A T R E O N.com slash Trek FM. And you've got all the details there of all the perks of the early access to episodes, exclusive content, producer credits, so on and so forth. So check that out. And also you'll have access to our patrons website, patron zone. So it does really take a great deal of money to produce and host and distribute these shows each month. So we really appreciate your effort. So you can find all the details at patreon.com slash Trek FM. Now we have some feedback. We got an email from a listener here of literary Treks. So Dan writes, I just finished reading the autobiography of Jean-Luc Picard. If you've read it yet, I'd like to hear your take on the ending. David Goodman chooses not to follow his fellow authors and goes in a completely different direction for Picard's life and other events after Nemesis. I find this very disturbing and disrespectful to the other Trek authors. I see that his publisher is Titan Books and not Simon & Schuster, so I guess this is why he can get away with this diversion, but I thought all Trek books were under the CBS property label and therefore had to follow a consistent storyline. Let me know what you think. Well, that's a very good question, and we did actually talk to David Goodman, and this very question did come up, and that's in Literary Treks episode 209, uh, titled I'm in Love with Beverly 2. And this was a bit of a concern that I had as well, because there are so many novels out there that have detailed Picard's life and what has happened to him, most notably, of course, after Nemesis. And what we learned basically is the books published have to be in continuity with anything that's canon, which is on screen in a television show or a movie. But he was not required to follow uh, what the other novels had done. And, you know, in some ways I really appreciate that because there's so many novels and there's such a backstory there that, you know, to kind of be held to that, I think would be very limiting for an author, especially one who's not writing in the same Uh, universe, I guess. I don't know if that's the right term, but not in that same novel continuity. So um, I kind of tend to think of it as bonus stories. You know, we get just a different take on what might have happened. You know, Star Trek author Kevin Dilmore was at STLV this past year, and I think the question came up in a panel uh, from one of the uh, audience members about canon or something. And I remember him saying, look, as Star Trek authors of writing the novels and the comics, he says, the best way I like to explain how we look at things is here's a story of something that could happen. This is a story that fits into Star Trek and not saying it happened or it's definite. It's something that could happen. And I think that's the way CBS and a lot of these authors and the publishers approach things. Simon Schuster tries to keep a consistent storyline, but they don't always do that. I remember 10 years ago, well, a little over 10 years ago, during the 40th anniversary, um, they had uh, David R. George III write the Crucible trilogy about the original series about Spock and Kirk and McCoy, and uh, it didn't fit into what had been established about those characters in the novels. He was told to just go ahead and just focus on what was learned in the episodes and the movies and didn't have to consider what was in the other novels. So his storyline of these characters and their lives tend to go a different direction than what was in some other novels. And with post-Nemesis, uh, Star Trek Online doesn't keep with the same storyline. The IDW Countdown comics didn't, aren't keeping with the same post-Nemesis storyline. And now we've got a new uh, Jean-Luc Picard TV series coming that will probably, for the most part, not keep up with the post-Nemesis storyline that's in the novels. Maybe it will, maybe it won't, or halfway will and halfway won't. We'll see. But my point is that, yeah, Dan's exactly right. CBS says that, you know, the TV shows and the movies are canon. And so they have to consider that. So the author, David Goodman, I don't look at it as being disrespectful. I know the Trek authors we've talked to many times feel like, you know, what I, what they write doesn't 
have to be used or the shows don't have to use it or other novels don't have to use it. They know it can be overwritten. They know that going in. So I like when we get a different perspective or a different storyline or something, because I already know about the life of Jean-Luc Picard from these other novels. So it's kind of cool to read an author write an autobiography that's a little different and go, oh, yeah, that's something that could have happened. I like that. That's a really good perspective. And I mean, the autobiography of James T. Kirk, written by the same author, uh, (laughs) it totally basically took Star Trek V out of canon and said that it was a movie made on an alien planet. So I don't know. I I find these books more of just kind of fun what ifs than anything else. So, you know, it, I wouldn't take it too seriously. And uh, like Bruce said, it's kind of, you get two stories instead of just retelling the same story again. So it's kind of a bonus. I like that. Another thing you could say is it's disrespectful to the authors. If David Goodman wrote exactly what they wrote in novels. It's like, okay, well, all he did was take their ideas and put it in one one book. (laughs) So you can say he was stealing it. (laughs) It's a good perspective. I like it. Well, we'd love to hear your thoughts on today's show or anything else that's come up in Literary Treks. And there are many ways for you to do that. The best place to join in the larger conversation is the Babel Conference. That's our listeners group on Facebook. And we'll, of course, have a thread in there for each episode that we've done. Just type Babel, that's B-A-B-E-L, into the search field on Facebook and it should come right up. If you'd like to send us an email, you can use the form on our website at trek.fm slash contact. Choose to send to a show and select Literary Treks. That'll come right to us. And you can also find the network on Twitter at trekfm and on Facebook at facebook.com slash trekfm. You can also interact with us on Goodreads. We have a Goodreads group. So go to goodreads.com and then search for Literary Treks and click to join the group. And you'll see what books we have coming up on future shows, what books we've read, And just join in on the conversation. So again, go to Goodreads and look up Literary Treks and join the group. We'd also like to thank Norman C. Lau, Ken Tripp, Greg Rosier, Brandon Shea-Matala, Justin Ozer, and Jeffrey Harlan for their support of the Trek FM network and being associate producers for Literary Treks as well. So Dan, when you're not chasing your father all over a planet and thinking maybe he has something to do with the murders, where can people find you? Well... Much like Riker, I'd probably start looking in the northern regions, kind of like Alaska. I'm in Alberta. It's not quite as far north as Alaska, but it's probably where I'd start. But when I'm not doing that, you can find me on Twitter. I'm at Kurtrats. That's K-E-R-T-R-A-T-S. You can also find me on YouTube.com slash Kurtrats Productions, where I make videos mostly about Star Trek. And you can find my novel, Star Trek novel, review site at www.treklet.com. Now, Bruce, when you're not negotiating fees with a Ferengi trying to get the best parts for your starship, where can we find you? Well, then I'm taking my fees and I'm buying Star Trek novels to read. And you can find me on Twitter talking about those novels. I'm at Admiral underscore Rex. That's Admiral and then the little underline and Rex. And then you can also find me talking Star Wars on the Star Wars Report podcast, where you can find most of your podcasts. You'll find Star Wars Report there. And of course, I'm always in the Babel Conference on Facebook. So thank you, everyone, for listening. And until next time, live long and read on. You call that light reading? To each his own, number one.